In the words of Kyle Bartholomew, the only word, way, uh, uh, person I am is uh, the obstacle between you and lunch. So <laughs> I would try not to get too crazy. But on the other hand, I really am the craziest person I know. <laughs> so I'm a curse and a blessing. <laughs> Please be turning your uh, Bibles to Exodus, Exodus 25. Today we're going to talk about how we're going to change our lives permanently. Uh, I like permanent change for the better. Then when there's something not so good, we change that. Those are not permanent changes. But today, I want to challenge us. I want to convict us to the core that there's something about our heart that is not right still. We need to get down to the bottom of why is it that we still, as children of God, have not achieved the glory of God to make this church appear in the presence of God. So when somebody looks at the kingdom of God there without a doubt, saying, that is the kingdom of God. This is what we're going to be. This is what you are, but we're going to take it to a higher level. We're going to take this church to a place and time where people are, they're just scared of it. They're like, oh my gosh, I'm just going to join because I'm, I'm afraid it's going to pose me. I want people on UH Hilo to tap each other going, bro, just get baptized. Just repent. You get baptized. Those people are going to come after you. They're going to study the Bible. They're going to tell you to obey the Bible. It's going to be crazy. Just do it. Like Nike. In Exodus 25, we see here, Moses is in an interaction with the Lord. And God gives him a very specific task. You know, I, I got to take the time, though, to, uh, to lift up a couple of people here. I, I, I sure do appreciate uh, Cindy Bartholomew. Let me tell you something. I don't know how those Bartholomew boys... My goodness, talk about being maximally spoiled. That woman can do everything. Everything about her is neat. Everything about her is perfect. I mean, I'm telling you right now, I, I, I see Jay come in. He just plots himself on the thing, watches his baseball slash golf. And he talks about golf and baseball. And then he just so magically has a cup of cold beverage. And then the mill just pops up and the house is clean. It's incredible. Uh, it's been a great, great stay at the Hotel Bartholomew uh, bread and breakfast. Each morning I woke up, you know, and I was thinking about, man, I just want to go to Zippy's. I just want to get some Lomi Lomi. I want to get some Kalua pig. But then right there, there's an intervention. Bacon, eggs, and rice. <laughs> a perfectly balanced diet for an Islander. And without doubt, she is the kindest person. So thank you so much for loving us. Exodus 25. Uh, while we're turning there, just a little bit about myself is uh, I don't have anything special about myself, but I'm married to that woman. Amen. And so that's what makes me special. Um, I'm 47 years old, so I still, I'll be able to live at least 10 years. Uh, uh, Kyle Bartholomew really is my best friend. Uh, he's kicked me my butt around. He's beat me up. He's told me, you're a loser. You need to change. Uh, shut your mouth and just obey. Uh, Kyle has made me feel like I should choke him or do something to him. But the size really does matter. <laughs> Every time I go over to his house, I'm like, I'm going to give that guy a big hug. <laughs> Joan, of course, as uh, small and mighty as she is, has been able to really get into my wife's heart and help to mold and change her and to, with the word. And so I really appreciate about that because Kyle speaks Bible. And so I'm praying that in our duration, however the Lord has it while we're here, that we're going to speak Bible to each other. Amen. So we can turn around and go, that's great advice. You got a scripture to back that up? <laughs> to get that point. So we're speaking like in code right here in the college. Bro, I can't believe that guy just told me Matthew 6 did. Oh, bro. Hey, did I tell you that time? Bro, can I talk to you? Because I'm kind of Galatian 5 it right now. <laughs> we're going to speak Bible. Let's speak Bible right now. Exodus 25. Let's start in verse 1. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering 
for me, each man whose heart prompts him to give. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn of fine linen. Goat hair, ram skin, dyed red, hides of sea cows. That's a kind of a crazy request if you think about it. Sea cow. That's kind of like a manatee. But it's got a different kind of nose. And it says here, olive oil for the light. Spices for the anointing oil, for the fragrant incense and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastplate. Then have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishing exactly like the pattern I will show you. And right here, from the very start, you see that God is an amazing interior designer. <laughs> God knows how to do the exterior and the, you think that God is the master engineer. So if we're going to build something, follow the master engineer's style of building, the color concepts, the color schemes, how he blends the colors in, what he uses. Because everything is down to pure perfection. So that when people walk to the house of God, they're not going to be like, hey, is that Joe Smith's house? It would not be mistaken for Joe Smith's house. They're not going to say, is that the community center? They're not going to say that. When they come to the house of God, they're not going to say, is that the community church? No. Their people are going to stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> but, oh, that's the house of God, unmistakably. That is the house of God. When we build according to God's word. Amen. Turn to Hebrews 5. Come on, Mark. Come on, Mark. Hebrews 5 is one of those scriptures that everybody reads, uh, and then they're like, wow, that's amazing. It took me like five years to get that. Yeah. Some are slower. <laughs> Come on, Mark. Hebrews, is Hebrews 5 still in the New Testament? <laughs> I swear, it was here the other day. <laughs> yep, there it is. I knew it. So in Hebrews 5, I'm sorry, Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8, and verse 5. Let's read this together slowly. And it says, They serve in the sanctuary that is a copy shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. What? Hold up. Wait a minute. Let's take a step back here. The Bible says that they served at the sanctuary. Let's change the words to modern language. They served at the place that looks exactly like the house that is in heaven. So God gives us a sneak peek at what heaven looks like. Woo! Amazing. But how do we make our lives look like that as Christians? How do people look at us and see their marriages? And they look at us when our wives are challenging the tar out of us. They're telling us, honey, you're just not patient with the kids. And your friends are at the house and you're just like, you can, they can see the steam coming out of your ears. But instead of yelling, you go, amen, sweetheart. You're absolutely right. I'm so glad that God blessed me with you today. At, at this very moment, to my core, I feel like I'm melting. My heart's getting soft right now. And you're totally right. I should be patient to everyone, including the kids. Because they belong to God. They die, they go to heaven. I die questionable at this point. And then your friends are like, why in the world is that? Give me some of that. What is that? It's the kingdom of God. Yeah. Built according to the specifications. But I want to ask you something. When you're at work, or at school, or at the park, or on the bikini beach, do people stare at you and go, wow, that is the kingdom of God? Or do they look at you and they find some other obstacle? Like, wow, look at that thing moving. What is that? I've never seen one of those before, but it sure is staring at me. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully not. You see back in, uh, in, in, you don't have to turn there, in Exodus 25, how God paid very specific to the elements, to the specifications, to the very, very, very last detail as to how to build His tabernacle. You guys ever watch The Gladiator? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, right. So we have seven men in the house. And four of them were sisters. Come on, 
guys? <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, yeah. Levi, yeah. what are you building here? <laughs> Gladiator, guys. <laughs> Homework number one. Watch Gladiator. So after after they come up to this gruesome battle, uh, the uh, king calls um, Mark, Marcus Aurelius into the tent. But you notice the tent when you walk in there? There's like a sink right there, wash off the blood with the berries. And there's this, all this elaborate furniture everywhere. You guys remember that? Yeah. The four of you, sisters yeah. and two bed brothers. <laughs> Shameful. And then, and, but you see this elaborate gold post and everything and it's like, these are human beings and that's really how they traveled. Because yeah. that's how they treated their king. I want to ask you something. When you travel around in your day-to-day -day life, in private and in public, how do you treat your king? With elaboracy? It's a good question, isn't it? I think it's fair. Go back to First Chronicles. You guys ever built anything in your life? Try to? I'm with you. I, uh, there was this program in, uh, I'm, I'm actually from the island of Guam. And, uh, amen. You got one, that makes two of us in this entire planet. And half of your kids. And so, we, um, in Guam, there's this thing called land for the landless because a lot of us over time, the military took the property and people bought it out and all this stuff, right? But anyways, I moved to this other island which I'm also blood native to in Saipan. Uh, um, uh, and so they had this thing called Land for the Landless. And because I was a single father at the time, I qualified to get this property to build. And so I picked out this thing out of a hat, it was a number, and I gave, they gave me a piece of property. So I was like, ha! Huh. For 45 bucks, I still don't know the numbers, it's 54 or 45 bucks to privatize it after five years of taking care of this property. And when I built the foundation, I took great pride. I said, man, I got in there in the trenches and I worked with these laborers. And then we built the walls and the columns, and it was amazing. The concrete, I mean, you couldn't touch that concrete. It was two and a half feet thick. Steel wire mesh, half inch rebars. I mean, this thing was over, I mean, you could be, you could, it was zoned for six floors, and I was only gonna build one. And it was amazing, until we started building the walls. I didn't pay very close attention to what the laborers were doing, because at the time, um, I would bring them beer. Not a good idea when people are working. Don't bring your workers beer. <laughs> but I paid them so cheaply that I was like, I feel compelled to buy them something. Mm -hmm. So, but the inspectors showed up one time and uh, the guy was carrying around this little weird mallet looking thing. And he was against the wall and he was doing this. What was that sound? <laughs> Come over here. And he brought me there and he, he said he was going to gently tap to test the concrete, right? He went, and the thing broke. And in it was beer cans and cement bags. Oh <laughs> and potato chip bags and plates and forks. And they were, they were filling the stuff in with the trash. I was always wondering why these guys were so neat and orderly. What are they doing with the trash? I don't have to pick it up. Because they filled the concrete with the trash. And I didn't pay attention to them. <laughs> and I was like, what are we building here? And I felt the inspection. It's $1,300 a pop. Wow. And you have to pay the inspector for that. You come up for the secondary inspection. You have to get an inspection with the new blueprints because you have to pay for blueprints, new ones. They cancel that one. You have to get new ones because the old one fell, even though it's a, the same copy. And uh, I say all that to say this is that we're like that in our Christianity. Sometimes... We don't pay attention to the way that we're building. We fill our voids with things of the world. The junk that is not according to the specification of God. Mm -hmm. Those supposed to be 3,000 PSI of poured concrete vibrating the oxygen out of it so it's so solid. But that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. Junk was put into it. I'm praying right now that none of us are putting junk into our Christianity. Praise, because the junk junks up our Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't sound too smart, but that's what I got. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about building the house of God. Come on, Mark. Come on, Mark. Building the house of God. Turn over to 1 Peter 2 with me. Come on, bro. Come on. I got to be honest with you, I'm thinking about a lunch plate right now. <laughs> We went to Cousins the other day. Man, that was good. We had some of those, uh, what were those bomb things we had? 
Bro, the mainland does not know what to say. They don't understand how to use the word bomb. That was bomb diggity. Those were so good. I was like, I want to be your cousin now. First Peter 2, starting in verse 4, it says, As you come to him, the living stone rejected by man, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are built are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Is the Bible saying here that when we build, that Jesus is a foundation? He's the chief cornerstone. He is the most precious stone of them all. But it also says, you are being just like Jesus. You also are a living stone. Now, I've been uh, to uh, Kona last night, and on the right and to the left, there was a lot of stone, and none of them were that beautiful, to be honest with you. They look like you go up to them, and they will tear you apart. <laughs> they will rip you up. And so, you can go outside right now and find a piece of stone. None of them really look, some of them look pretty beautiful. But stones don't become beautiful without polishing them. Precious stones don't just become so precious by just taking it out of the mud. You don't just like take a muddy rock or stone and just put it on your wall. That's just dumb and dirty. But that's not how to build. Let's go back over to 1 Chronicles 22. We got to build with perfection if we're going to build the kingdom of God. And take pride in what we do. And let's take off in 1 Chronicles 22 starting in verse 1. Give me an amen when you get there. Amen. Awesome. Amen. It says, Then David said to that the, the house of God is to be here and also the altar of burnt offerings. Now, I know maybe a couple of you guys have some construction uh, backgrounds or whatever. Maybe you built a tree house. Maybe you made your bed once. <laughs> For half the guys here, that's like construction, right? Single brothers? Caps brothers? So... But for, 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 for David, he got the contract. He got the contract. He was commissioned by the Lord to build the very house of God. Let me put you in David's shoes for a moment. Sandals, whatever. Barefoot. I don't know what he's wearing. But you're now responsible for building the house of God. How do you feel now? Not some guy who's a millionaire that wants a house overlooking the Hilo Bay. We're talking about God. He says, here's the blueprints. Go find these gems. Go find this gold. Make it pure. Go find this ruby. And get me a sea cow fin. You're like, oh man, that's a lot. I'll be calling up Levi right now. Levi, go get me that sea cow right now. <laughs> I'll be calling up that brother right there. Come on, bro. Help me with this cement, bro. It's just, this is difficult for me. I'm going to be looking at some of you guys with your jewelry right now. I'm thinking I'm going to take that right off your ears. I'm going to put it in right there because the Lord wants to do it. The, 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 the gems, it wasn't like Noah's Ark where the animals came to him, right? After he built the ark with specifications. They had to go out and get these things. They had to commission people. There was a lot of work involved in building this house. A lot of work involved in building this house. When you're investing in something, you take the time to investigate whether you're making a good investment, hopefully. If you were going to go out and buy yourself a piece of shirt, like a chemo certified, qualified Aloha print for the night time. Okay? <laughs> Chemo's not just going to be like, okay, I'll take your word for it. It fits. It's, a, it's an Aloha shirt. No, 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 no. <laughs> Made me Nate, but not chemo. <laughs> if you say it's a shirt, it's a shirt. Not chemo. Just the stitching. Is it right? Because you know how some shirts you buy it at 50% off and all of a sudden you're wondering, you're going, I don't know about the shirt. It looks a little... <laughs> Does this make my butt look fat? <laughs> and, 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 but it's got to be qualified. It's got to be certified. You take the time to really invest in what you're building, what you're doing. You don't just go to a lumber store and say, let me have some lumber, and they give you a tree. <laughs> Here you go. Here's a plane. No, you take the time to make sure that it's not all cored up. It's not cement in it, recycled, refurbished wood. There's no nails in it. 
There's not a bunch of bowing in it. You want to get the right lumber so you can level your building, so you can build correctly, right? I want to ask you something. The things that you're choosing to build your Christianity right now, are they filled with holes? Are they crooked? Are they a reflection of the master? The things that you're using, the amount of purity that you're trying to build your Christianity with, is it from God? The amount of perseverance that you include in your Christianity, is it there? Does it exist? And if it's there and it exists, are you excelling from where you're at? Because God's amazing temple continues to rise, continues to get built up. As the scripture said in 1 Peter, it is continually being built up. So it never stops until we reach our eternal destination. Amen. Verse 2 says, So David gave orders to assemble the aliens living in Israel, and from among them he appointed stone cutters to prepare the dressed stones for the building, for building the house of God. He provided a large amount of iron to make the nails and the doors of the gateways and for fittings, and more bronze that could be weighed. He also provided more cedar logs than could be counted. Then verb, drop down to verse 5. It says, David said, My son Solomon is too young and inexperienced. And the house is to be built for the Lord. Should be of great magnificence and fame and splendor in the sight of all nations. Amen. And you read here, and we've seen it, we've heard it, we've talked about it many times in Matthew 28. That all authority has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Amen. To all nations can know that the house of God truly is in Hilo. Amen. So that all nations will know that the house of God truly is in Kona. Amen. And the rest of these islands. Amen. I dream that one day I'll be dead. <laughs> that's a promise I can keep <laughs> but I'll be staring down from heaven with a new body thank you Lord Jesus <laughs> a new name more exciting than Mark <laughs> sadly the only thing that I'm probably going to regret is that I won't have the same wife or be without a wife but hey treat her nice while you're here on earth <laughs> enjoy, enjoy the prize <laughs> and I'm looking down and I'm going, Jay was baptized. Like the Bartholomew girls. What? There's more than one girl? They both are in hula, but they're disciples. They're awesome. Dave Kelly had five more sons. <coughs> and they're all preaching right now. <laughs> Robbie's still alive. Robbie's in heaven and he's commanding a battleship <laughs> filled with angels filled with angels it's going to be amazing I, I can picture myself looking down and seeing the whole entire Mariana Islands Micronesia, Belau Islands Nauru, all these places that you're going I didn't know those places existed there's not just Samoa and Fiji and Tonga, there's other islands out there this is the new one <laughs> and to see it evangelized. Yeah. People that persecuted you that are now your discipler. Nope. <laughs> it's happened to me. <laughs> Guys you study with that you're going, this he's never going to make it, this alcoholic, drunk, womanizer, and therefore you know he's your evangelist. <laughs> it happened to me too. <laughs> this girl that you confessed all your sins. Oh, I slept with that girl. Aren't you engaged to be married? Oh, I slept with that girl. Aren't you engaged to be married? Man, I partied too much last night. You need to slow yourself down. And then the next thing you know, you're baptized. She's coming to your baptism. And now she's a disciple. She, she watched your life change. The people watching your life change. Transforming to something newer and better and greater and magnificent. The first point, I only got two points. The first point is build with great magnificence. In verse 5, it said, David said, My son Solomon is young and inexperienced. And the house of the Lord is to be built. Should be built with great magnificence. Come We've been looking all over for houses here in Hilo. And it seems like there's a lot in Kona, but we're not going there. 
<laughs> and uh, it's funny, the one house that I was fell in love with, it almost gave Cindy and uh, Carrie a heart attack. <laughs> we walked into it, the floors were broken, the, there was vines growing through the thing, and yeah. it smelled like cat pee, and there was, the, the moss was sticking over the house. The, uh, it was, it was, it, uh, the kitchen smelled somewhat like a man's public urinal. <laughs> and, uh, and I walked into it, and I was like, this is it, we're home! <laughs> And then Cindy was like, oh. <laughs> Demon come out of that man. And I was like, how dare she? And then Carrie's on the other side, Demon come out of that man. And they were chasing me around trying to perform an exorcism. And, and, but, but when I saw that thing, Cindy said to me something that really struck me. She goes, it was not until the next day, because you could tell she had been given a lot of motherly thought to this. <laughs> Even though she's more, we could be more sisters and brothers than mother. And then she says, are you sure you just don't want that house because you want to fix it up? And I thought about it. I was like, no. Then later on, I was like, maybe she's right. Maybe I do want to fix it up. Maybe there's something that God put in my DNA that is determined to fix every dilapidating, collapsing, <laughs> contemptuous, out of place, broken down person in this earth. And that house is a reflection of my attitude towards the loss. But I want to ask you something. When you see a dilapidated, smells like cat urine person walking down the street, who's, who's just broken down, the cobwebs and the moss is all over their neck, the sin. Do you look at them and go, oh my gosh, that's the one. Come here. I'm going to wash you up right now. Woo! Do you look at the people that way? Do you truly look at the people that way? So I'm going to shock you right now. If you truly believe that the people are exactly that way in your hearts that way, we should be somewhere else because this place would be too small. Amen. Absolutely. But you know what? Amen. You know what we're going to do? We're going to leave this place because this place is going to be too small. On, in the next year, we're going to go out to the streets. In the rain, in the shine, or in the sprinkles. It doesn't matter. On, we're going to go everywhere that there's people, and we're going to hunt them down. <laughs> we're going to make them our friends or our enemies. But either way, we're going to love them. Yeah, yeah. We're going to love them according to the pattern of this book. And we're going to build based on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. We're going to expand our thoughts beyond where we're at right now. And I appreciate your perseverance. Because I know that the hardships that this particular church has been through. Yeah. I understand that you've gone through transition after transi transition after transition. Yeah. And I understand this personally because I was orphaned. I mean literally orphaned. My mother dropped me at the front door of some people's house which I didn't even know their name. Uncle Terry, I mean Uncle Du, which I don't even know if that was a name, and Auntie Terry. They were a military black family in Guam. And she said, boy, can you go get me my purse? And I said, sure. And I was crying inside. Because my mother, I was nine years old, she had her purse around her shoulder like this. She said, boy, can you go get my purse? And I knew that this happened before, when I was six. I turned around and said, sure, I'll go get it. And as I walked in, I heard that clunky car of her start up and drive away. I came out to see dust. I didn't see the woman until three years later. She picked me up and she dropped me off to another house. And she said, boy, can you go in there and get my purse? And I looked at her with another purse again. She had a beer in her hand. And I said, sure, I'll go get the purse. And I walked in and I got the purse, looking for the purse. Looking, where am I going to sleep now? Who's my new family? So I'm with you, heart and soul. I understand what it feels like to be orphaned. I know what it's like when a mother and a father in the faith just uproots and leaves. What good or bad? Nobody's a bad teacher. No one's a bad preacher. We don't diss preachers. We don't diss each other. We just are who we are. And because of that, we need Jesus. I'm not even the best speaker. If I take off this suit, you guys are going to be like, that's not hire that guy. <laughs> what were we thinking? You guys are going to be like, Mark, can you go get the purse? And all of you guys are like, I come outside, I'm like, 
Whose couch am I sleeping on? <laughs> because that's how we are when we're orphaned. And I, I, I would put my life on the line right now that some of you guys are hurting because of the previous transitions. Because of the amount of sacrifice that was shot out of Hilo. I wouldn't say sent out. Shot out. Because every one of those guys were like a bullet, man. They came to LA and just went through it, got trained, sent out. Every single one of them. Amazing. But you guys have seen people come and go. Your families come and go. Renee, Levi, Mel, they're back now. And uh, the uh, Kelly, Loa, Nate Reed, just why don't you go ahead and continue to the list? <laughs> Nate Reed, all these guys. And then we sent out the, uh, the famous Kona planting. Woo! That started the tent ministry. <laughs> I don't mean to, to joke about it, but we've done some things that are hurtful. We've collapsed in our faith a little bit here. Let's just get it out in the open. We're family, right? Well, I'm the kind of guy, I don't care if you come and you look at my bank account. You ask my wife, how are you really doing? We're totally transparent. I am not an excellent in anything guy, but I do love God. Amen. And I will tell you that I will fight to the finish. I am, I am not done in LA. I will fight to the finish, although I'm salivating to come down here. You walk into my house and 90% of my house is packed up. So when the people in my ministry, all 61 of them come in, minus two, they come into my house, they're like, whoa, are you leaving now? I said, no. I just kept, I'll keep my word, I'm a man of my word. I told you, I am down to the finish. I'm just getting prepared, like any smart evangelist should. And please, God, speed up time. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm blown away by the Hilo Church. Yeah. And something came over me, and, and Cindy asked me, because I started, I came home the other day, I was like, I just say home. It feels like home. And I was feeling a lot, and when I had to go out and pray, I prayed so much that I skipped breakfast and almost skipped lunch. That's, that's a real big sacrifice for me. <laughs> and I was feeling a lot. And Cindy was like, maybe you missed your son. Maybe you missed your kids. And I was like, yeah, I missed them. But I've been longing for this for a very long time. Kyle and I have been scheming this. I've been talking to Kyle. I flew Kyle out to, to, uh, to uh, Phoenix when I was out in Phoenix because been, I've been listening to his preaching going, that guy's the man. <laughs> that guy's the kahuna. And so we flew him over and I fell in love with his preaching. I fell in love with his perseverance. Uh, he, he's, I, I was like, man, I'm older than this guy, but when I grow up, I want to be just like that guy. <laughs> Like, uh, there's a movie about that guy goes back. The, what's the name? Uh, what? No, no. Anyway. Benjamin Button or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Benjamin Button moment. But a lot of this has come into it, and I, I didn't know what came over me. I, I, I thought, man, am I getting depressed because like, we didn't find a house yet? Why God have we found this? How can we need all these things are closing? And then we cruise down to. Uh, to uh, Kona, and we were out there, and we watched the sunset, and we were, me and uh, David uh, Kelly were going with our second grade jokes, and everybody was like <laughs> fake laughing it, <laughs> and then uh, and then his daughter got up and did the the hula, and but she sang as well, and then the sea was so calm, it was like glass, yeah. and then just as the sun was disappearing, she started singing the words, mm -hmm. and I realized I'm home. This is the kingdom of God. And I realized that this is what my life amounted to. I speak three languages. Chamorro, Rafalawash, and Gupala. All three of them are unwritten languages. Well, the Hollies attempted to write Chamorro and they messed it up, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I realized that God made me who I am and the hardships that I had because He wanted to shoot me back home so we could rescue our people. Amen. And that's what we're going to do. But I need you guys to hold me accountable to the highest. Because when you look at me, and I don't look like a reflection of God's temple. It's not shiny. It's not pure. It's not open. It's not baptizing. It's not being gentle to his wife. It's not loving his children with great honor. Because they're kids given to him alone by God. You guys need to speak up. Not just to me, but to each other. 
That we don't hold any bitterness or grudges on each other. There should not be any talk, no slander. This is going to be an amazing family of God. No one's going to walk into a room feeling, oh man, they're probably talking about me. No way. That's not a family of God. A family of God walks in and then there's a five people ready to disciple you and you're like, oh, they're going to love mommy right now. <laughs> this is all about me. They're just going to love me and disciple me and disciple me some more and I'm just going to change and I'm going to get better and I'm going to start being like that reflection. Some of us right now probably have a little bit moss growing in our Christianity. <laughs> Let's be real. When was the last time you got into a cranking Bible study? Let me finish the rest of that. Of someone that you met. Of someone that you met. I was hoping to not hear the deadly silence, but, <laughs> but that's okay. You know what? Today we will meet somebody. Today is a new beginning. Today, we will build God's family, which is our second point, building God's family. I don't know about you, but I'm a family guy. I'm a super family guy. I should have broke it to my wife gently because we got married. We got a house. Before you know it, 10,000 campus students were living at it. And the honeymoon was shortly then over. But building a family is not easy. We have a lot of babies in this uh, little church right now. When they come out, they're so beautiful. Right after the wife is, if you had a C-section, it's really weird. You walk in and it's quiet. And all you hear is little tools. And then they make the incision. And the alien comes out. And it doesn't say anything for a while. And you're wondering as a father, is my child going to be okay? Then all of a sudden, it reminds you of yourself. Oh, nasty and everything. Then they're cute to look at. And you're like, oh, the little baby. Then it's walking. Then it's talking. Then it's asking. Then it wants money. The one thing that you're wondering when is going to come. And then it grows up. And it's looking to the world to replace its mother and father. And it's wondering, should I leave the kingdom? That's what these babies do. We got to take care of our babies in here. Amen. Anybody who's been, who's been a disciple for more than 20 years? Okay. So if you're wondering how these guys did it, it's not because they memorized the Quran or the Torah or the whole Bible. Trust me, just ask Robbie about his, when he first started dating. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure if I made a vow not to talk about that. But is this a good time? They made it through discipling and perseverance. They made it through to this day because they opened the doors up and they knew that here comes Battlestar Galactica. Which none of you guys have watched, apparently. Star Wars, here comes Star Wars. So, so they, people got in their lives and they even secretly told them, let's not talk about this. I, I don't want a long discipling time. Let's make it a short one. Okay, let's pick the sins that we're going to talk about. But let's not talk about the financial one, okay? It's almost 20 times. Don't make me look bad. <laughs> These things happen in their lives. It happened to the point where they were like, okay, here's the thing is. Um, let's just not, let's get open, but let's not try to get completely open. How do you think they survived? They survived because people knocked down their doors and loved them. Yeah. They survived because they also knocked down people's doors and said, hey, love me. Yeah. They, someone told on each other. So today we're going to be a bunch of tattletellers. <laughs> For the first time it's going to be okay. That when you see one of God's children walking around and his boogers are coming down to his mouth, <laughs> you stop, it's not okay. When you see one of God's children walking around and that diaper is down near the ankles, do not stop and sit think it's okay. When you see one of God's daughters feeling neglected, do not stop men. It is not okay. God loves them more than us. I think God says, says that God shows no favoritism, but I see how He treats the women in here. It's always special. He compared her to the church. Oh my goodness. What do you compare you to? Dirt. <laughs> Out of the dirt he made man. Dirt. Dirt bag. That's why I know we got to take guys. You promise. Come on guys. Hold up your hand. Hold up your hand guys. All of you guys. 
And repeat after me. I promise to protect my sisters. To respect them and love them with all purity. And I vow to God what I have said. Okay, that's between you and God now. I want to share some statistics with you. The Empire State Building. Anybody ever seen it? Anybody ever seen it in real life? It's a 102 story building and it towers 1,425 feet. 27 men died to see this tower erected. 27 men with families. I read the articles. The Hoover Dam, 726 feet tall. It's two football fields wide of poured concrete. You were in the masonry, right? Yeah, so you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, and there really was nobody that was buried in it. I checked it out. <laughs> but that's 171 feet taller than the Washington Monument. Wow. That's pretty tall. But nearly 100 men died in there. So that they could bridge two lands. So people can get from one place to another. And people sacrificed their life. Women were given a letter. Sorry, your husband died. This happened almost a hundred times in a couple of years. The Golden Gate Bridge, 20 men lost their lives. 11 of them fell off of a beam and just missed the catch net. But they were there, they signed a paper, says we're going to do this so we can bridge one land to another so people can get across to the other side. The Panama Canal, from 1880 to 1914, over 30,609 men died. Over, oh, that's how many men died. And they believed in what they were doing. Some of them probably got tricked into it. <laughs> the Burma Canal. Burma Canal. 160,000 men died to get a 258 mile railroad built so that the food can go from one place to feed the Japanese soldiers. They risked their lives so that people can get fed. Over 500,000 men and women have died in Iraq. And that ticks me off. Because the total number of these people amount to zero if they're not right with God. Amount to zero. And every one of these guys were a precious, potential, living stone of God. It was meant, God inspired us by Jesus. He meant for us to really be a living stone so we could be built up. And continuously to build one, other, one another up so that all men will know that there's hope in this dark world. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 2. Oh, Is this helpful? Yes. Yes. Ephesians 2. Hopefully this is not the first time you read the scripture. <laughs> but if it is, try to hold a straight face. <laughs> Starting verse 19. Give me an amen when you get there. Amen. Amen. It says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and it rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to come to become a dwelling in which God lives in His Spirit. That's who you are. When somebody asks you, hey, what's your name? What do you say? Living temple of the Almighty God. Amen. The dwelling place of the King of Kings. No longer are you just a skin that holds blood in <laughs> and muscles. <laughs> and if you're like me, fat. <laughs> but it's a dwelling place of God. Do you realize that that's who you are? Does it think some of us walk around here mistaking ourselves for human beings? Some of you guys think you're Hawaiians. Some of you guys think you're, you're Europeans. Some of you guys might even think you're black. But you're not. <laughs> even Austin thinks he's black. But let me just tell you right now. You guys are sadly mistaken. Sadly mistaken. Your intelligence and all your IQ and everything you've learned in your life has just went out the door. <laughs> You're none of that. 
You are a child of God, the living stone. You are a dwelling place of the temple of the creator of the universe. Not even Iron Man could touch that. And Iron Man is like one of my favorites. <laughs> Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens and fellow, fellow citizens with God's people. You're fellow, fellow citizens. You know what's uh, interesting is that some people that live in foreign countries, they really fight hard to be Americans, but they don't want to lose their privilege of being an alien or a, a countryman. So they apply for these dual citizenships, right? And they make it a big deal. Who, do, you guys ever, do you guys know what a dual citizenship is? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. They're like, I got my dual citizenship, so I'm this and I'm that. Mm -hmm. Like, whatever, dude. But when I ask you something, do you have dual citizenship? Good question, bro. Do you have dual citizenship? Like when Jesus asks you for your passport, do you like get to choose what you're going to give him? <laughs> this is a good one. It's a righteous one. Or this one's good today. You can't have one foot on earth and one foot in heaven. That's right. It's not going to work that way. If you have dual citizenship right now, I'm asking you to revoke one of them. <laughs> Preferably, it's the citizen of the world. Yeah. Your citizenship should be with Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only. Yeah. Do not commit adultery on the Lord. Yeah. We've got to build stronger, closer, tighter-knit families. Um, my kid is right now is being watched by... Who's shooting what? Who do they watch? Who's watching them? <laughs> Renee. Renee. <laughs> what? <laughs> you told me you hired a nanny. <laughs> Renee's awesome. She's gonna take it. He, they're probably watching Batman right now. <laughs> but Renee is amazing. We've had five people watching our children because we, we know that when they come into the house. Even though they may have a sinful intention, if men are transparent, and all men should be transparent, we're, we're, we are not special. We're special in some way, but we're not <laughs> special. In God's eyes. That we have thoughts of abusing child children. We have thoughts of going after another woman. We have thoughts of untraining ourselves from being righteous. We have these thoughts. There's men right now that are quivering in their shoes because they don't want to admit it. But that's who we are. And we need God. But today, my, for this last week, my kids have been watched by disciples. I could hire experts that pass background check and all that stuff. That's nice. But I want somebody who's going to love my child and train them in the way that they should go. So when they get old and they're teenagers, they'll realize that there's no other place but the kingdom. And teenagers, don't you forget that. Yeah. This future. You're going to be our leader, so hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm without a doubt, I feel like my children are protected. Yeah. Do you for, feel protected by one another? I've asked some questions while I was here, because I'm the investigative type. <laughs> and I said, hey, what's this person's dad's name? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Hey. What's that guy's favorite color? What? <laughs> hey, what's your fiance's middle name? <laughs> it's a good thing there's five of you guys that are engaged to be married, so we won't point them out. <laughs> but then, <laughs> oh! I wasn't gonna blow the cover, but this sister pointed it out. <laughs> First Corinthians 13. Without, without true a trueness to our family, we're never going to make it, guys. What's going to get us through Hilo? An awesome, amazing, funny, good-looking, skinny preacher? No. Let me know when he gets there. Shut up. Keep on. So, what is it going to be? Is it going to be the talented singers that are up here and they are talented? No. It's not going to be that. Our amazing, obedient... Full, full of conviction, having their quiet time teenagers? No, not even them. <laughs> Is it going to be our amazing shepherds? And they are amazing shepherds. Yeah, they are. Is it going to be them? No, it's not. It's going to be this. In 1 Corinthians 13, in verse 13. And now, these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of this is love. It's going to be true love. True love is going to get us to the next level. True love 
is going to help you understand your Bible more. True love is the only way we're going to be able to speak Bible because true love comes from the Bible. Whether it feels good or not. True love only comes from God. The next time I come back, I got some homework for you. I would like to find out next time when I say, hey, what's that guy's story? That brother. I mean, I got a good excuse. I just landed. But the rest of us should not have excuse to know what our favorite music is. You know what I mean? What that person is allergic to. We're so small right now that we could be that. But imagine that every one of us was completely unified and filled with conviction. Exactly the same. How effective we could be together. Moving like one big wheel. But we can't do that. My name is Mark. I'm 47 years old. My favorite color is brown. Now you know. You guys feel closer to me now? A lighthouse story. There was um, somewhere in Europe, there was uh, jagged rocks out in the middle of nowhere. And these ships would come in and the winds would carry them to unknown places because it's very, very dark. So often the ships would break into the rocks <laughs> and they would capsize. And people would go into the icy, chilling, dark water they couldn't see past their nose. And some of the natives got fed up and said, people were dying while we're sleeping in our comfortable duck feather beds. <laughs> we got to do something about this. And so they erected the first lighthouse. They, they put out a shiny beacon so that anybody coming in from the dark could see where they were going. It became an incredible thing. They made it a full on lighthouse. It became so cool that they saved many lives. It became the gathering place of the, of the village. They said, hey, let's just put some furniture here in the, on a wood stove. This is where we'll have our weekly town meetings. One day they made it so comfortable and so awesome. It was amazing. People from all over the town were coming, reporters, sketch artists to draw this lighthouse. And one day they heard it. A foreign ship broke, capsized. Foreigners of different skin colors were swimming and screaming and you could hear the children crying and drowning. And they complained because they're going to move out of their comfort zone. They're going to go into the icy waters and put themselves at risk. Why do we have to be the ones to go down there and rescue these people? They said. So they had another town meeting. Anybody we rescue has to go in the basement because they're making the carpet wet. And they're muddying up the sofa. They're eating all the food that the natives have put together. This is unfair for our club. So a few people left that place. Well, that place became a clubhouse for the, na for the, for the, for the uh, natives. These few people went down the street and they erected another lighthouse. One that was watched 24 hours a day with one chair. To be a shining beacon for those who were coming in the dark. Icy, cold, lost place. These were the people that were rescued the first time. Who did not put up with watching people go die alone. With no hope. You're the lighthouse. This church is the lighthouse. Anybody else outside of this church is capsized, falling in the icy, chilly water, and the jagged rocks, dying right now. While we're in our lighthouse, in our warm, comfortable, duck feather beds, wondering should we go out there and rescue those people that are complaining. I could hear them. But I'm not so sure if I should get out of my comfort zone. A lighthouse keeper stays awake and he's on watch. That's what this place is going to be. We're going to be the watchman that sees every soul passing by. To the point where we're like, hey, can you come to church with me? I would really want to sit down and show you the Bible. But before we do that, can we hang out and be family? That would be awesome. What's your name? What's your favorite color? Hey, what's your fiance's middle name? <laughs> By the way, he got it right. It took him a minute, but whatever. 
and that we could become that beacon for the lost world. But there's magic to it. Matthew 6, so that scripture. We can't do this without instructions. You guys want to build? Yeah. Then let's build it right. You guys want to have fun? You guys want to get crazy and wild? I love my job. I love my job. This is awesome. I mean, look at this. We get to talk about God and point people towards not going to hell. That's incredible. Verse 33 of Matthew 6. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Real simple. In order to build God's house, we got to seek first God's kingdom. And that's each other. In order to build perfect family, the one that resembles that of God, we have to be careful. Pay careful attention. Build only with great magnificence. All together, we'll build God's grace, an amazing family. To be that beacon of hope and light to this lost generation. I think there's something special about this group, but that's not what I think that is that matters. It's what God knows. Yeah. Each and every one of us were destined to be one thing. Greatness in the likeness of the King. And that's who we are. From now on, we hold our head up high. We get down on our knees. We open our Bible and we open our mouth every day of our lives. So that people are not screaming and being capsized right now outside while we're in our comfortable place right here. Next week, when I'm not here, this place is going to double. Can we have a bring your neighbor day? We're having a bring your neighbor day next week. So every person is going to bring a neighbor. That means everybody. Including yourself. And we're going to be early. And we're going to sit like this more. Instead of going out there. i got to be honest with you, those chairs are kind of tricky. So I get it. I get it. I get it. Because I have kids too. I would like if that kids came to work and goes, psst. You come over here, your kid's being naughty. I get it. But we're going to have to be a tight-knit family. We're going to have to love being close. So boys, you wear that, some of the deodorant that Mercy's given out. <laughs> shower, shower once a week and walking in the rain does not count. <laughs> and so we can be a tight-knit family. How many people do you think we can bring out here to, uh, next week? 100. 100? Well, let's shoot for a hundred then. We'll, Kona will have theirs. And we'll have ours. And let's not let Kona shame us. There's just a few of them down there. But man, they're really doing it. And they're doing an amazing job. Guys, it's been fun. We had some laughs. And I, I think inside my heart, I'm tearing up right now. Because the last thing I want to do is get onto that airplane. So if any of you guys know terrorists, now is the time to make a call. <laughs> But I pray that today is not a day of just laughter, but joy because we get to be true living stones of God. Let's commit to that. Amen. Amen. God be the